So, um, so my name is David Williams. Um, I am a kind of a multifaceted faceted individual in that I, I've done a lot of youth work, youth and community work, working with mainly at-risk young people, young people that are marginalised from their communities for a range of reasons. Hello and welcome to Obehi Podcast. I'm your host, Obehi Ewan Fo, and I strongly believe that everyone has a story to share. Now let's get started with this episode. Um, and I've been doing that for approximately 30 years now. Um, but I'm also a singer, songwriter, a musician. So I, I, I make records, I tour, I perform, um, and I do that internationally. So, um, so there are kind of like two sides to me. There is the youth and community work side, and there is the music side. That's, that's a quick introduction. And that's very interesting. Those are powerful uh, two fronts that we can actually navigate to, no? Yes. And because I understand that in the UK, uh, yeah, this is something that re requires a particular attention because of um, a lot of young people are there that need attention. So, yeah, this is a, and it's some, a very important conversation that I'm going to have with you today. Yes. Of course, also music as an artist, that is also very important. But first, we know you, uh, who you are, and a bit of your background. So were you born in the UK? I was. I was born in, in a city, the second largest city in the UK called Birmingham. Birmingham. So I was born in Birmingham. But interestingly, I, I, um, I lived there for nine years and then I emigrated to Jamaica. So that's where my parents come from. And I lived in Jamaica for 10 years. So my childhood is literally split between England and Jamaica, which, which was great for me because I got to understand my culture firsthand, you know, um, well, a part of my culture, because Africa is the motherland, but <laughs> Jamaica, you know, is, is where my parents and grandparents and their parents um, came from. So I got to understand my Jamaican culture firsthand, which was very beneficial, I think, for me growing up. I, I, want, to, I want to also take advantage of that, because a lot of people that I've interviewed in the UK, particularly of Jamaica heritage, um, they have either visited Jamaica or uh, they, have been, they, have, they have never been there, but they know that their parents have come from there. Yeah. But in your own case now, you have, you have lived there for 10 years, That's which fine. is a different <laughs> story altogether. Definitely, definitely. So tell me, in your young years of, say, now you are 7, 8, 9, 10, tell me a little bit of your experience in Jamaica. Okay. Um, this, is, um, <laughs> this is a bit difficult. Okay. Now... Growing up in the UK, so that's the first nine years of my life, I was with my mom and my sister, and that was a very loving, nurturing, caring environment. Um, very, very gentle, kind of like wrapped in cotton wool for the first nine years of my life. We believe that everyone has a story to share. We believe in the power of storytelling in today's digital economy. Yes, we believe that our audience need to be touched at the level of emotion so we can better engage. What about you? Do you believe in storytelling as much as we do? Do you want to reach the hearts and minds of your audience? Then join us with our online training class, Storytelling for Content Creators and Digital Entrepreneurs. Come, come to obehiel14.com slash storytelling and learn how to leverage your storytelling skills so you can earn more as a content creator and digital entrepreneur. Storytelling is a powerful instrument at our disposal. Let's explore it together. See you in the class. Moving to Jamaica for the next 10 years of my life was a complete different scenario because the, the, the upbringing, the way that they raise a child in Jamaica culturally and normally is, is quite different. And so it was a much harsher environment. It was, um, you, I, was cared, I was cared for, you know, fed and had a roof over my head and all that kind of stuff. But in terms of the nurturing, that doesn't come that naturally to a lot of Jamaican um, parents. So, that, so you, you know, it's, it's more harsh. You got jobs to do and you, you're, you're disciplined harshly. And therefore it's a complete, it was a complete different scenario and environment from the environment that I grew up in for the first nine years of my life. And that was hard. That was difficult for me. But it also 
gave me um, resilience and an understanding about how difficult and the challenges that the world is going to present to me in later life. So although it was hard, it was something that I, I, I took as um, a learning ground for me. I didn't take it in a negative way. I took it in a positive way in terms of, okay, it's hard. This is a difficult situation to be in, but I'm going to learn from that difficulty. I'm going to get stronger from that difficulty, if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. A lot of sense. Yeah. So uh, this, um, this discipline, of course, you didn't see like a punishment as it were, you know, because you know sometimes we are talking of uh, cultural differences now. Yes. Because some people don't understand the cultural norms so that they look at uh, maybe when some parents are strict to their children as if they were punishing the children, but that's not what it is, though. Yeah. Of course, you need to understand it to understand that is not what it is. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think you know, this is a really, this is a, 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 a sensitive subject for me and a difficult subject for me because uh -huh. if, you put, if you bear in mind I'm a youth worker, uh -huh. it's my job to empower young people and to help young people through a difficult process. And, and, and what you have to understand about youth work, um, because a lot of people don't understand youth work, they um, they think youth work is is adults playing with kids, taking them playing table tennis and 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 pool and taking them out on trips and having fun, and that is the fun side of youth work. But there is a very serious side to youth work that a lot of people do not understand, and that is that youth work. The whole purpose of youth work is to develop a a, a young person personally, socially, educationally, and possibly spiritually. So that is a big that is a big thing, and that that gives a young person confidence in themselves. It um, enables them to interact with other people in an appropriate way. It it pro it gives them the power to to have a voice, their own voice, to speak about what they believe in, to find their to find themselves, their authentic self, and then to make an impact on the world. Now, when you put youth work, when you look at youth work like that, you realize how important youth work is. So. I'm saying that to come back to the point about, you know, the, the way different cultures are and disciplining your children and stuff like that. And so, you know, I, I understand why my grandparents disciplined me in the way that they did. And I understand their culture and why. But I also understand that that's a program, that they, they were programmed to be like that. And that actually comes from slavery, really. That's where that all these beatings and all this kind of stuff comes from. It comes from slavery. Um, and some people don't unlearn the program and it's not easy to unlearn the program. But I think, you know, speaking for myself, I think it's important that we look at why we do the things we do, even if it's cultural. And then we, and then we assess, is this good or is it bad? Does it do more harm than good? Does it do more um, good than harm? And then we have to identify how we want to move forward. So, um, you know, culture isn't always right. Culture doesn't always make it right. You to, <laughs> sometimes you have to look at your culture and you have to assess. Am I doing this just because of it's my culture? Or am I doing this because I actually want to do this? And if you don't want to do it, and you're only doing it because it's your culture, maybe you shouldn't do it. You're right. You're, you're right. We need to be mature to understand that the culture actually is made for us. We are not made for the culture. That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Now, I want you to help me clarify one thing there, uh, that um, you, you think that uh, the the, um, the harshness that your parent has uh, towards you, or maybe what the many Jamaica will have towards their children as a, as a code of discipline, is uh, something coming from slavery. Yes. Uh, but if we have a similar situation in Africa, where would you say that is coming from? The same because, place. The same place. Mm -hmm. The same mm -hmm. place. You know, um, um, people in Africa had, had suffered from slavery as well. They were impacted on by slavery in a big way. Um, and uh, that impact kind of set a precedence about how they, treat, how, how they were treated, first of all, and then how they treat others. And, uh, you know, with slavery, when I think about the beatings that I used to get when I was growing up in Jamaica, uh, it, it, and I look at slavery, it literally mirrors it, literally, you know? And it's like, you're getting beaten to do a job. You're getting beaten, you didn't do this properly or you didn't do that properly. That's exactly what the slave master would have done to the slave. It's like, you know, they're giving you a task to do, 
and they want you. And if you, you know, if you don't do it well, you're going to get lashes. That's literally what I can, I can equate that to growing up in Jamaica, you know, like pick up the leaves from under the tree, sweep the front of the yard, wash out the pig pen, take the goat out. And if anything isn't done exactly the way it's supposed to be done, you're going to get a whooping. That's just, that's literally, that's the same. I, you know, when you, when you start looking at it properly, that's where it comes from. And I believe that Africans suffered this as well. Not just the, the, not just the slaves that were taken from Africa and brought to other places, but it happened in Africa too. And it, and I think it's left an impact on the way people behave. And it's about unlearning, unlearning the programs that have been put in, in, uh, that have been laid out in front of us or that we've been put within. It's about unlearning those programs. And it's not easy, but you know, it, it, it is possible to unlearn. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that is a very interesting line that, that, that can actually be betrayed you know, in a way that uh, harsh discipline is, is coming from. Mm. Because it's something that is common uh, quite across uh, in Africa. Yes. I, of course, I speak of Nigeria because I'm from Nigeria. Yes. Every Nigerian parent is very harsh in disciplining their children. You know? Yes. That, yes. Uh, yeah. I remember, for example, when I was uh, in the primary school, in fact, in one of my books, I did reference to the particular situation. There is a cane the teacher used to flog us. Yes. In fact, the cane has a name. The mm. name for the cane is called Ujomo Saka. Ujomo Saka, in my language, would mean, don't, okay, it would literally mean spare, uh, spare the rod and spoil the child. Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, they really discipline us in a way that uh, we should not go the wrong way. So we have to go the right way. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I don't know either if all of it actually is coming from slavery, but I know that we do pass that experience. Um, yes. And I think this is something uh, that is highly uh, ingrained in people. Yes. Uh, but okay, having said that, and because you are a, a youth worker, you work with a lot of youth, uh, which means you have got it, uh, training, you have got it, understanding about education and how to impact people with, uh, with education. What should be the, the right way to educate people instead of okay. the one that you have passed through? Okay, so so I'm 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 not a young man anymore. I'm I'm quite up there in age, um, which which um and so there I, I I have two children. So I not you know I've I've worked with thousands and thousands of children in the thirty years that I've been a youth worker, um, yeah. and I have a particular approach in the way that I engage with young people and the way that I that I try to um, encourage them to do well and to do things and to do tasks. And I'm exactly the same with my children. Um, you know, I um, and I I believe. Uh, what I think where it comes from for me, my approach is this: I would like any young person that I engage with, including my children, to do things because it's the right thing to do, because they know it's the right thing to do, and not to do things because they're scared of me, but to do things because they know it's the right thing to do and they respect what I'm saying. Now, if I want someone to do something based solely on it's the right thing to do and they respect me, that means I need to give them some independence in making the decisions about what they do. And if I'm going to give you independence, I can't be beating you to, <laughs> because now you're doing it because you know that I'm going to beat you. You're not doing it because it's because you know it's the right thing to do. You're not doing it because you respect me. You're doing it because you are scared that I'm going to beat you if you don't do it. That's not, for me, that's, that's wrong. That doesn't make sense because as soon as I'm not there, you're going to do the wrong thing because there's no more. You don't have, you're not scared of anything. Now you can just do what you want. Um, you should be, you should be doing things, you know, based on what I call integrity. You know, you're doing it because it's the right thing to do, whether I'm there or not. Beatings are, are never going to give you that result. Beatings are only, you're only going to do things properly um, if you get beaten because you're scared. And I don't want my children to be scared of me. And I don't want any child to be scared of me. And I want children to be able to discern, to make a decision based off their own, independently. I want them to be able to make a decision about what is right and wrong. And then do that, whether someone's watching or whether they're on their own, if that makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, not only that, it makes sense, but it's also very interesting. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, how are you able to get the children to um, 
To understand this uh, without uh, able to make the decision, not necessarily because they are going to be scared, but a rational decision that this is wrong, that this is right, and the opting for what is right instead of what is wrong. Not because that is going to be consequence for yeah. doing what is wrong, uh, or maybe if you do what is right, that is going to be a reward for it, but you just know that this is wrong and this is right. Okay. Help me understand how you plant that into their head. Okay, so so my approach, I, I can give you a, a real easy example. I can give you a quick example. And, and an, an example that I'd say was probably one of the most challenging one for me and my children was tidying their bedroom. That was a difficult one because my children didn't want to tidy their bedroom. And I would never force them to tidy their bedroom or say, I'm going to beat you if you don't tidy your bedroom. But what I would say was, I would really like it if you tidied your bedroom. I would like that. That would be pleasing to me. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm not forcing you to do it. I'm just letting you know that I would like you to do it. And if you do that, I am very happy to, um, to reward you for tidying your bedroom every weekend by giving you some pocket money. However, if you don't tidy your bedroom, I don't feel like I can give you any pocket money. So I'm not, I'm not threatening you. I'm not forcing you. But I'm letting you know that if you do this thing, it is, there is a reward for doing this thing because it's a positive thing. So it's kind of like showing you that doing the right thing pays off and doing the wrong thing doesn't. So I used to give my children a birthday allowance. And what I said to them was, at the, at the beginning of the year, you're going to start off with 150 pounds from their very first birthday, even when they couldn't even talk back to me. I, you've got 150 pounds that you're going to get on your birthday. However, if you do not do your chores and do the thing that you're supposed to do, and if you misbehave, I will be deducting two pounds 50 from your birthday money each time you do something wrong. Yeah. And if you do your chores and you do things well, I will be adding to the 150 pounds each time. So it's up to you. The ball is in your court. I'm not going to beat you. I'm not going to shout at you. I'm not going to threaten you. I've laid it out on the line. You have this amount of money. It can, you, can, you can make more by behaving well, or you can have money deducted and end up with nothing at the end of the year when your birthday comes around. The choice is yours. But notice, I'm giving them all the power. They have the choice. I'm not making anybody do anything. I'm not forcing anyone to do anything. I'm just letting you know that for good deeds, you will get rewarded. For bad deeds, you will lose something, and that is it. Yeah, I like I like your approach. It's very interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. really, very interesting. Yeah. Um, and 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 I think I think I, I think what's good about this approach is that you 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 end up building a relationship with your child where they feel more at ease speaking to you about anything because they're not scared of you. Because if you're scared of someone. If you got to tell them something difficult that's happened or something that's happened that you're, you know, you're so scared, you can't tell them. You're going to probably go and tell a stranger more than tell your parent. I would rather that they feel comfortable that they can come and speak to me. So the, the relationship that I'm building or that I'm trying to build with my child or any child that I work with is one where they say, you know what? I know I can go to David and I can speak to him about anything. You know, he's, you know, he's not going to get angry or want to beat me or, or, you know, he's, he's going to, He's going to be very calm and he's going to listen to what I'm saying. And then he's going to, you know, then we're going to be able to try and work something out. So, um, so that's why I think this approach is important because I think it builds the relationship between you and your child. And there isn't this resentment towards your parent because they are seen as this person that just comes and beats you and, and, and disciplines you harshly, even sometimes when there's no need for it. Mm -hmm. So. So now you using resources to to be able to control the children at the at the end, at the at the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. In that mm, you don't use cane to flog a child because he does what is wrong. Like I, I, the, example, the example I was giving on of a teacher that punishes us because we misbehave in the, in the school. But here in Europe, you don't do that. You don't beat the child. If you beat the child. That could be trouble for you. That's correct. But they have a way of making sure that you also pass the punishment on. The punishment is different, but you should pass punishment somehow. Yeah. So that what I'm trying to understand here is now is that it appeared to me like at the end of the day, the concept of the wrong and good thing for, uh, sorry, wrong and right. There is something wrong for you if you do something wrong, and there is something right for you if you do something right. 
Yes. And what is wrong, you get something bad. But yes. what is good, you get something good. That's right. That's so right. is it? it I, have, I want you to help me uh, Help me clarify that that is the same. Mm. Mm. It, it it is. And the thing is, the the only difference is is the approach that I'm taking kind of um, it isn't. It it doesn't fracture the relationship in the way that the beating would. I I see that as an I see that as a negative thing. I see that as something that is going to traumatize that child. What it actually, actually, it would be considered as abuse. It would be considered as something that they call an adverse childhood experience. And an adverse childhood experience is any experience that a child has that um, that 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 is so. Um, that ends up with them feeling trauma from it. it ends up with them feeling um, uh, maybe unloved, uncared for, um, neglected, uh, and and it's going to have an impact in in the way that they think about things and the way that they have relationships with other people. It's going to have an impact because they then are going to feel like that's the way that they should treat somebody else because that's how they were treated. And it's not. I mean, I've not. I've not raise my hand to my children ever. Um, and that was a very conscious decision not to do that because I feel like that is going to damage my child in terms of how they think, how they view themselves and how they feel about other people and how they treat other people. So, yeah, yeah. so I still but want to, them to understand the consequences, but I don't want them to be traumatized by the way that I get them to understand the consequences. Thank, thank you for that. That is that is very important. At least it is clear that um, the rubber right is the same everywhere. Is the approach now that that mm. we need to be careful about? Mm. I strongly believe. I agree with you that if you um, the, the physical beating is going to have um, a negative impact on the child. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but but how do we say that idea now to almost all the parents, particularly of our community, because. Uh, considering where we are coming from, yeah. it's common for most people to use the physical uh, approach instead of maybe because what you are doing now is more of a kind of the psychological approach to the same punishment because you are you are still punishing it anyway, yes. but it's different. That's so right. how do we say this one to the people so that instead of maybe using your hand, you can yeah this uh, reward and uh, punishment, but no physical punishment can be a better choice. Help you help you with that. Yes. I mean, the first thing that I did with my children, um, so I'm talking about from the age of two, when they could actually slightly talk and understand and hear and listen to, and have a conversation um, just about, um, is I, use, I used to do something that um, people might find amusing, but I used to use the thing that they call the naughty step, which is basically if the child has done something wrong, I would say, okay, you've done something wrong. You need to sit on the naughty step for a couple of minutes and understand, and don't move from there and understand that you're sitting on this naughty step because you've done something wrong. And the, obviously, you know, the child, two years old, three years old, four years old, they don't want to sit on the naughty step for two minutes. Um, but I'm saying sit there and think about what you've done. And then let's have a talk about what you've done and why I had to make you sit on the naughty step. So I haven't beaten you. I haven't shouted at you. I haven't made you feel scared or vulnerable in any way. I'm just getting you to sit down and think about what you've done. And then after that, we can talk about what you've done and I can explain to you why I had to make you sit on that naughty step and not play games and not do anything and just sit there in silence for two minutes. So it's still a punishment. It's still acknowledging that you've done something wrong. It's still a consequence, but it's without the trauma. It's without the, the lasting traumatization of the child um so i i very much believe in right and wrong and i very much believe in discipline and i very much believe in consequences i just believe like you said in the approach and there's lots of different ways to do it that's just one example of how i discipline my children um without the um without the angst without the you know without without the, the, the scaring them or, or making them feel so so weak and vulnerable and me feeling like an ogre or a monster. Um, I Interestingly, I, I, I used to work with um, some young people um, in the London borough of Sutton. Um, and um, 
this was over, I'm trying to remember how long, this was over 20 years ago. And a couple of months ago, two of the young men that used to come to the youth club there invited me, to, they wanted to take me out for lunch to say thank you for, for working with them and looking after them and being an, a, an amazing youth worker. Um, and um, when they took me out, it was, very, it was very funny because one of the young people was very well behaved um, when he was with me at the youth club. And the other one was very naughty. He used to give a lot of trouble. And I used to have to exclude him from the youth club lots of times. And he actually apologized to me when he took me out for lunch. This is 20 years later. This young man who is now in his, in his 30s said to me, I know that I gave you a lot of trouble when I was at the youth club. And I know that you had to exclude me from the youth club a lot of times. And I actually want to apologize because even though you excluded me all the time, and I was very angry that you were excluding me. You always excluded me in such a respectful way. You sat me down and you talked to me and you explained to me why you were excluding me. You told me that you didn't want to, but it was because of my behavior. You explained it all to me. And then you asked me to leave, but very respectfully. And he said, now I understand it. I understand why you did what you did. And I'm actually grateful that you did that. So do you see the difference? Like because of the approach that I took to disciplining this young man, he has never had any animosity towards me. He still loves and respects me and he's, has even brought me out for lunch 20 years later because of the approach. That's what's important. Thank you for that. But that's important. I, I, I appreciate that. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. It is the approach at the end of the day. You mm -hmm. know, it, it like what, what they usually say, it's not what happened. I think um, uh, Jim Raw used to say this often, no? it's not what happened, it's what you do about what happened. Because what happened happens to almost everybody. Yes. But what do you do about it? How do you react to it? What is your approach to that situation? Yes. I, I really find that to be very important. But there's another thing that I find important, even, no? mm. is that you said in the beginning of the story that you didn't like the way you were treated when you were a child. No? This uh, physical treatment, this physical... Um, I don't want to call it assault, but, but call, call it, <laughs> let's call it physical chastisement. Physical <laughs> chastisement no? of the parent. You didn't like it. But now, instead of saying, okay, I will pass it on to my children, you decide to reverse it and take a different approach to it. That is quite lovely. That is really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't want I don't know if you want to expand on that because I, I found that to be the most valuable of it all. Yeah. I think I have a couple of things that have enabled that to happen. I think the first thing, and I have given this a lot of thought, and I think the first thing is, I'm very fortunate that the first nine years of my life were very nurturing. So I have my mom to thank for that. The first nine years of my life, my mom, you know, she played games with us. She, you know, she, we had all the toys that we could ever dream of. Um, we would stay up on Saturday nights and, and watch movies with her and, uh, and we'd make houses out of quilts. And just, it was just very, very fun and very, very nurturing. So I've had nine years of understanding what it is to nurture and how it feels to be nurtured. And though I didn't realize that at the time, that has had an impact on how I view the world and how I relate to other people and how I behave. So going from that to the, harsh physical chastisement, which I had for the next 10 years, it didn't undo. I still had that nine years, which I think has influenced the way that I approach my relationships. And so I have a bit of a, I have a nice balance. I have that whole, um, you know, I've got, I've taken the positives from both of my, uh, my uh, upbringings. So if I look at the positives that I got from my grandparents, my grandparents were very strict, but they were strict on things like how to keep a house clean, how to wash your clothes, um, how to present yourself. So I've managed to learn all of those skills from my grandparents. So if we put the chastisement aside, I've learned about discipline and respect and, um, and I've learned how to, to look after a house. And, and, and things like that from them. But I've learned the loving, caring, nurturing, nurturing stuff from my mom. So I've got this balance of both as a grown up now. Take, and I take, I've just taken the positives from both, both of those experiences. Um, 
So I think that has helped me. And then to compound it, I went and I studied and got a postgraduate degree in youth and community work, which teaches the theory of how to nurture a child. So I've got my own life experiences and I've got the theoretical studies of how to nurture a child. And I think when you put that all together, that has shaped my approach to engaging with young people and children. And that, that's where it comes from, I think. Thank you so much for that. Mm. Um, well, before somebody get it misunderstood, I want it to be clear that uh, uh, the parents that uh, perhaps has uh, had a different approach by this way, maybe physical chastisement, they don't mean any harm. No. They mean good for their children. That is why they are doing this. Yeah. In fact, in, in my culture, it is said that you punish a child for wrongdoing, not for that particular wrongdoing, yeah. so that it doesn't repeat it next time. Yes. Yeah. So this, we can see now, this is for the good of the child. No? Yes. But what we are saying here now is that, of course, taking from you, mm. is that there is a consequence to that, other than just not doing it next time, but there is a kind of inherited trauma that is that the child is going to suffer later. Yes. So this is why we are, uh, you are suggesting, and I really appreciate it, that we could have a different approach yes. to how to correct children when they do wrong. I would love that. Yeah. I want to thank you for that. And yeah. I want you to expand on, on that on mm. that aftermath. Yeah. Mm. 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 Yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, we have, uh, you know, the first thing to recognize is that a lot of the things that we do, we do from programming. Let me make, me, let me make this very clear. A lot of the things that we do we do from learned behavior. We are being, it, it's, it's what we've been told we should do. But it doesn't, mean that it's, it doesn't mean that it's right. Just because it's what your parents did and your parents' parents did it, it doesn't mean it's right. Um, and I'm going to expand on that a little bit more. And this is going, we're, we're going to get into some sticky territory. I think. Please I, go, please go. I like, we're, we're here for this. I, I, think we, I think I always get into sticky territory because I, am, I, I think I am a little bit controversial. I'm not trying to be controversial, but. The truth is not something that's always nice to hear. And people struggle with the truth. But a lot of, I think a lot of people, uh, people that, you know, say for example, that are beating their, their, their children, that is, that's learned behavior. That's from their programming. They're not even thinking about what they're doing. It's just autopilot. They're doing it because that's what they, they parents did to them. So that's what just comes naturally. But they don't even think about what they're doing. Um, and since we've come onto this part of this topic of programming, I, I think the three, the three main areas that program everyone, and, and, let me make, and let me be clear on this, I believe, and I may be wrong, but I believe every single person on the planet is programmed. We are all programmed. And three of the main things that program people, and I, and I can use myself as an example, is religion, number one, religion. Uh, your culture. So for me, it would be Jamaican culture. That's the main culture that I grew up in and a little bit of British culture. And then the country that you live in. So these three aspects um, program you from the day you are born. So if I use myself as an example, I grew up in a Christian home. So I'm learning about Jesus dying on the cross. I'm learning about the Ten Commandments. I'm learning about all this stuff in the Bible and that I have to, I have to do these things. If I'm going to be a good person, I have to follow all of these things. To be a great content creator in today's fast changing economy, you need one thing, storytelling. Storytelling is a powerful instrument to leverage either for personal use or for your business success. This is why this training class, Storytelling for Content Creator and Digital Entrepreneurs was created. It is designed to help you leverage the power of storytelling so you can stand out from the crowd and earn more in your business. Come to obehiair14.com slash storytelling and learn how to leverage your storytelling skill to earn more as a content creator and digital entrepreneur. You need the power of storytelling to stand out in the competition. So let's explore it together. See you in the class.
That's programming, right? The next thing is the culture that I'm growing up in. So the culture that I'm growing up in is I'm growing up in a Jamaican culture. So everything about Jamaica and, the, and what we do as Jamaicans, I'm being told I have to be like this. I have to act in this way. I have to behave in this way because I'm Jamaican. So I'm, you know, um, for example, I'll use one example. Um, Jamaicans do not have a great relationship with homosexuals, for, ex for an example. Uh, so I've been brought up in a culture where I should hate people that are homosexuals. Whether I hate homosexuals or not, is out, it doesn't even come into the picture. It's, no, you, you, you have to hate them because that's our culture. Yeah? Um, and then the country that you live in is another thing that um, shapes you and programs you. And it's like, there are laws of every land. So if I'm growing up in Jamaica, there are laws of Jamaica that I have to abide by. Now, bear in mind, these three things that I've just mentioned, these, things are, these three things are external to who I am. David Williams doesn't have to be a Christian or follow Jamaican culture or follow the laws of the land because that's not who I am. That's who I'm being told I am. That's who I'm being, that's, I'm being told I must behave in these ways. But actually, none of that comes from within me. So I, I'm more concerned with actually understanding who I am and what comes from within me more than understanding what comes from outside of me. So I've taken it upon myself to unlearn the program and find out what I believe in, what I like, what I actually think is, is right from wrong. Not what I've been told, but what I believe deep down in my soul. And anything that is uncomfortable for me to do, whether it's coming from my religion, from my culture, or from the laws of the land that I live in, anything that feels uncomfortable within my soul, I reject it. I don't need to do that because that's not me. That's who I'm being told to be, but it's not actually me. Does, does that make sense? A lot of sense. If I have a question for you, that is the most important assignment that every human being have, which is the ability to unlearn the programs. Yes. Because like you said, it is right. Every one of us is programmed. Yes. It doesn't necessarily mean only in the computer terms. Yes. It just means, what is a program? A program is just a routine, a pattern that is that is there. Everything is according to it. But because it's so natural, it's so, it's so natural for you, yes. you don't look at it like it's, it's, you are in a program. Exactly. A, a good example, like you already said, is culture. Exactly. You know, we just greet in a certain way. Even our language are part of the program. We just say things in a certain way. The way we put our inflation and the way we... All this, one, of course, have a lot to do with us. I'm not saying they are good or bad, but I'm just no. saying it is the way it is. Yes. But I also like the, the what you are saying, Dom, that because all of this, nearly all of it are coming from the outside, Yes. it is important that we know that we are also existing in this complexity. Yes. Who are we? Yes. Who are, in this sense, who, is, who are you as an individual? Exactly. What makes sense to you before you can then relate to the environment where you find yourself? So the question really is this one. How do you do that? I mean, how do you unlearn the program so you can then find who you are yes. and then learn again? Yes. So, so this is the concept now, Obehi. This is the concept of what I call finding your authentic self. And I think everybody has has the right, and actually I think everybody should be on a journey to find their authentic self. It's not your fault that you've been programmed. You were born and then everybody's telling you, you have to do this, 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 this. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. But you have a responsibility to actually find out who you really are, not who you've been told you are. And I think, that, I think one of the best ways to do that is Anytime you're doing something and it feels uncomfortable, ask yourself, do I have to do this? Why am I doing this? And if it's just because of its, cult and it's just because its culture or religion or anything that is external to you, then realize that you actually don't have to do it. You, I, I've heard people say, I've heard people say, oh, it's really horrible, but I've got to do it because it's my religion. Oh, it's really horrible, but I've got to do it because it's my culture. Oh, it's really, well, if it's really horrible, that means that's your authentic self talking to you. Your authentic self is telling you, you don't like this thing, 
But instead of not doing it, you're saying, oh, but I have to do it because it's my this or it's my... No, you don't have to do it. That's what you need to understand. You don't have to do it. <laughs> it's very simple. It's very simple. Yeah, it's very simple, but I don't think it's very easy as no, it will. No, no. <laughs> um, it's not so simple to do, but when you when you look at it in black and white, it's very basic. And um, there is a um, there is a quote from Eartha Kitt. I don't know if you know Eartha Kitt. She was an actress and a singer from back in the sixties and seventies, and she was quite famous. And um, she did. She I saw a little quote from her on Instagram a couple of months ago, and she said, life is not problematic. We make it problematic. We create, she said, life is actually really, really nice. But we as human beings, we invite problems. We create problems. We make life a problem. But it's not a problem. Because if we just live in, in our authentic way and do what, we, what feels natural to us and comfortable to us, really natural and comfortable, not trying to fit in a box, Life can be really, really good. But because we are fighting against ourselves, and that's what, when you are trying to find your authentic self and you're clashing with things that you've been programmed to do, that's what makes life difficult because you're fighting against yourself. And how difficult must it be to be fighting in your own head? You're, 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 you know, that's, that's quite a challenge. I think this argument would need to be taken to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, because it is it is important. You know, there are certain things that we'll say. Okay, maybe we don't need to talk about this. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, we find that everything is related. Of course, in Africa, we know that everything is connected. There is there is nothing that exists on a separate layer on its own. That's right. That thing doesn't exist. Everything is connected. You are a man because you are also related to a woman. Maybe you are a father. Then you are also in the society. Perhaps you are you are working. Then you have worker. There are other people. That are working with you, so you cannot just exist on your own. Everything exists no. in, no. in with with other people. So when when you say <laughs> this uh, question of unlearning and learning is something that we need to do, particularly us Africans really? and African diaspora. Oh God! Because the program that is running in our head sometimes, for the fact that it is not designed by us, sometimes it might be intentional to work against us. That is why uh, it is, like you said, it's not your fault that you have those programs running in your head. No. But it is your duty yes. to find out about those programs. Yes. You can leave it after you find out. Oh, maybe it's even better for you to just be running like that. But then you make a, an informed decision. Mm. Mm. I think this is important. But how do we say this idea to the people so they can... Because I repeat again, this, is, this should be the biggest job that we have to do for ourselves. Well, I can tell you this now, Abehi. I can tell you this right now. It is my mission. It is literally my mission. It's, it's, part, it's literally why I exist right now, to help everyone find their authentic self. I think it's the most important job everyone has. And, and the reason why is because when you find your authentic self, you find true happiness. And when you're truly happy, that has a ripple effect on everyone around you. So if you actually, you know, people are, people are going around now with mental health issues. People are, are, are uncomfortable in their own skin. People are unhappy in their marriages. People are unhappy at work. All of this, all of this could be resolved if people could identify their authentic self, be truly happy with who they are, and then it would give them the confidence to interact with people in a positive way. Because, they, because the most important relationship you will ever have is the relationship with yourself. People don't, under, people don't you know, this is, this, is, this is like the most important thing is, you know, until you are comfortable in your own skin and happy with yourself, you, you will not give, you will not be... Um, effective in a relationship with somebody else because you're not comfortable so your energy level the way that the energy that you're emitting is not the frequency is, is going to be low and when you're when you're emitting energy on a, a low frequency of energy it's going to bring people down it's going to bring you down it's going to bring everybody else around you down so you need to find that happiness in yourself and you i think the best way to find that happiness is to be your authentic self 
It's so it's super important. All right. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, you're a youth um, a worker. You have been that for like 30 years, you say, right? Yes. Yeah. Why? Why do you do that? Why do I? <laughs> why do I do that? Um, because I think, you know, I, I, I didn't have a plan. I didn't even know I was going to be a youth worker. I stumbled upon youth work accidentally through, through my music. Um, because I, 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 um, I met um, a woman who was a youth worker and, and she knew that I was a singer and she was preparing a group of girls to sing at a concert in the youth club. And she just said, oh, I need someone to help me with these girls because you know, they're struggling to get the song right. And I know that you're a singer. Could you come and help? So that this was back in 1992. Um, and um, so I went to the youth club and I helped the group of girls with their singing. And I just volunteered my time. And I ended up enjoying the experience so much that when it finished, it was a six week experience. And when it finished, I asked the girl if I could come and volunteer at the youth club and just do it all the time. And she asked her manager and her manager agreed that I could. So I ended up volunteering at that youth club for three years. And then I went off and I got my postgraduate degree in youth and community work. And ever since then, I've been doing youth work all over the country. Um, and, and so in answer to your question, why do I do it? I, I, I recognize how important it is for young people to, to understand themselves. Because what it is, is with youth work, Young people, when you're between the ages of 11 to 21, you are finding yourself. You're actually trying to understand who you are and you're, you're, you're learning about independence because up until that point, probably your mom and your dad have done everything for you and have made most of the decisions for you. But when you get to 11 and you're going to, you're going to start secondary school, now you're starting to make decisions for yourself. Now you're having to be more independent and it's a difficult time for a child. They might struggle with their identity. They might struggle with their confidence and youth work is the thing that helps that child to understand who they are, learn how to relate to other people and just learn about finding themselves. So for me, it's just one of the most important jobs ever because it's the thing that prepares people to go out into the world. So I, I love the feeling that I get from empowering young people. I love that feeling. That is good. Yeah. That is very good. <laughs> when the feeling is good and you like what you like, or you like what you do. Yeah. You know, it is saying how be that it doesn't look like a job for you. No. no. All right. No. Now, in, in, um, in a more practical sense, what do you really do with this uh, youth? I mean, tell us a bit of how your day is run with them. Well, it, it depends because the it depends because the, the the breadth of youth work that I've done in the thirty years is really is quite vast. So I have worked with a, a, a range of different what we would call cohorts or groups of young people. So I've worked with young people that we would put uh, that we would call generic young people. They don't have any issues or problems as such, just in a in a playful fun way, but I've also worked with young people that are um, advanced in their intellect and their intelligence. And so, for example, work with young people that are um, youth parliaments, kind of like um, young people that act like they are the parliament of, of, of their area, where they make decisions about what happens to young people and, and what they do and what kind of equipment we take into the youth club, like a youth committee. But I've also worked with the, the, the furthest end of youth, young people, so we're talking about young people that have committed crimes and end up in prison. So depending on who I'm working with, um, it, 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 it dictates what kind of engagement and what kind of activities happen. So I've done, I've done like, I've done it all, <laughs> really. Um, it, it's very, it's very, very different depending on the young person and the needs of the young person. But one of the first things that you need to do is build a relationship with the young person and I find out what, what needs they have, what things are they, what, you know, what's, what might be missing? What do they need to develop personally, socially, educationally, and possibly spiritually? And when you, All right. Yeah. Uh, this might be a, a, a strange question. I don't know if it is. 
what are you learning from this youth? Yeah, because you are living in a in a world that is now uh, that soon you will pass on to another people, no? Mm. Which is your children, the people that the generation that is coming after you. Yeah. Uh, perhaps sometimes the orientation is different. Perhaps the exigencies are different. Perhaps the the dreams are different. Yes. Uh, the dream that our fathers had is not the same dream that we have today in the sense of really what is the essence of what we need, no? Yes. So uh, sometimes we need to exchange, yeah. you know? So we learn from the people that are very old, they tell us how life was for them. We see that sometimes it's this a little bit different, but we learn, you know? Yeah. But sometimes we can also reverse in that we learn from those that are growing up. So what do you learn from them? I learn a lot from young people and I always have felt that I've learned a lot from young people. And um, another, another thing that I, that I um, kind of recognize is that the world is always evolving. Um, the world is evolving around us. And so the young people are different to when I was, you know, when I was young, 30, 40 years ago, when I was a young person. The young people now, the world is different. The young people are different. Technology has made a huge difference. And so I learned from the young, they, in one, for one, they keep me young. Because, you know, even though I'm, you know, I'm 51, but I don't feel 51. I still feel like I'm 19. And that may have something to do with the fact that I'm engaging with young people all the time. And the things that they talk about, um, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of those things because I'm having discussions with them. So I learn about the new trends, what's important, how they feel. But I also learn about how the world is evolving. Um, and I'm evolving with the world because if you don't evolve with it then you are stuck in the past or you do get left in the past um and if you're happy with being in the past that's okay but um then you're going to find that you might might be in an environment and you're trying to communicate and people don't understand with that is 20 years old so <laughs> so yeah so i learn i learn i learn a lot from engaging with young people definitely all right. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and you do deliver um, a strong impact today. That is why you are still there. In that they love what you do, and you love uh, the in the, in, in the relationship. No, that yes. is not only one way; it's going both way. Definitely. Now, Definitely. somebody might want to ask: How do you really deliver a true impact in the work? How do you impact people? What kind of strategy do you need to um, employ? <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, this is a good one. Um, so I think, um, there are, there are some key, there are some key things to consider in engagement. Um, one of them is, is holistic assessment. So, um, and holistic assessment is about understanding the person as a whole person not just in parts, but the entire person. So understanding their background, understanding um, their education, understanding their family situation, understanding their, their needs, what they've been through, what they've experienced. It's the whole person. So if I, if, I if I took off my hat as a youth worker and put on a hat as a teacher, when a young person comes into school, more often than not, the focus is on ac academics. The focus is on teaching you English, math, science, geography, blah, 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 blah. And the focus isn't on the whole person. It's on an aspect of the person. How, academic, how academically bright is the person and how can I help this person to, to um, develop academically? But they're not thinking about personal development, social development, spiritual development and all the other areas, they're not thinking about, is that child feeling safe at home? Are they being, is there domestic abuse at home? Uh, what is their neighborhood like? All these other aspects that impact on the child and also impact on how well the child is ready to receive learning. But you can't just think about the learning and not think about all the other aspects of the child's life. So with youth work, it's best to have an approach where you are looking at the the whole person and you are assessing 
what the, what needs that person has based on all aspects of their life. So that's the first thing, holistic assessment. The next thing I think is really important in terms of my approach is a relational approach. And a relational approach is something where you are, it, the, the relationship is mutual. So you're giving and taking. It's not like I am the boss, I'm older than you, I tell you what to do, you listen, you shut up, you behave, you do what I say. That is an approach in a lot of environments when children and adults are engaging, that the adult is the boss. The adult says whatever and the child has to do it. Um, uh, in my approach is no, we're equal. I respect you and I would like you to respect me. And I want, us, I want you to feel free to speak to me and engage with me and know that I will listen to you and I expect you to listen to me. So it's a very mutual relationship but I'm giving of myself and I'm sharing with you who I am so that I build a bond with you. So, so when, when I ask you to do something, you'd be more inclined to do it because you respect and value the relationship that we have. Um, more so than a, a teacher um, who may be instructing a child to do something and expecting them to do it because they are the teacher, but they have no respect or love for the teacher because there is no relationship. So that relational approach makes a big difference in terms of getting the result that we want from the child. Um, and, and then the other thing is about giving people the opportunity to make decisions, empowering them. Like, so, you know, instead of taking away the, the, taking away the, um, the option of what do you want to do? How do you want to do it? And, and, di and directing what you want to do with them. Actually, getting them to say what they want to do, getting them to explore, giving them the power. Because this is a beautiful thing when you can give someone power. It's, it, it's easy to, to, to take power and be the boss, but that doesn't develop the relationship. What develops the relationship is when you are sharing power or when you're giving power and making someone feel more confident in themselves. So these three aspects are very important to me. Holistic assessment, relational approach, and empowering those that we engage with. Those three things make a huge difference. Um, and yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, okay, apart from working with the, with the youth, we understand that you also do music. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your music? Uh, that is also very important. If I, I, I understand that, that is where you, 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 you move from music to working with the youth. That's right. So now let's go back, music. Okay, <laughs> so music. I, 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 music for me is like, is, is everything. I, I, you know, I, I think my two passions in life, my two passions really are music and youth work and music came first. Um, I've been, I think I, I've been singing from as far back as I can remember. I cannot remember a time when I wasn't singing. Um, and I, I can recall um, going to primary school before I went to Jamaica. So when I was still in, in, in Birmingham, in, in the UK, I can remember going to, to primary school and singing in the playground at break time and lunchtime and crowds of children gathering around to hear me sing and to listen. And, you know, I'd be singing all of the popular songs that were happening at the time. And I've always done that. And I went to Jamaica and I did the same thing when I went to school in Jamaica. And then that moved on to, um, singing on the sound systems. So you have in Jamaica, you have these big sound systems that play music like outside on the streets or in a certain area, they would put all the speaker boxes up and, and stuff. And my uncle used to DJ and sing on one of the local sound systems. So when I was about 13 years old, my uncle started bringing me to the sound system with him. So I I've been singing from like professionally, I've been singing from at least 12, 13 years old. Um, and I and I just kept on doing that, really. Yeah. All right. Uh, what kind of music do you sing? What is your style of music? Um, my my genres are, are quite diverse. I I sing um, reggae, dancehall, um, R and B, um, house, all genres really. But the one that I'm known for, the one that people associate me with, is a genre called jungle and drum and bass, which um, was established, I think, in about 1992, 93. And I got involved in it in about late 93, 94. Um, uh, and in that genre of music, I think I've had 
about 19 underground number one singles and I've had two number one albums um, in the jungle drum and bass genre. So that's the, that's the genre that people know me for, but I do sing across the board. That's, a, that's interesting. So uh, you are, you are still a singer today, right? Definitely, yeah. I'm, I'm actually, funnily enough, I've just been booked to perform in Gambia um, in uh, December. Yeah, in mm. December. So I'm, I, I haven't been to Gambia before. This is going to be my first time coming to Gambia. Um, but I've just been booked to perform at a, a club in, um, in Gambia. So that's very exciting because I haven't been there before. All right. So if people were to uh, be looking for your music now, I mean, how can they find you? I mean, tell me uh, where are your music available? How can people connect with you to listen to your music? Okay. Well, I, I think a lot of people use Spotify now. Um, and I do have a Spotify account. And my, my artist name is David Boomer. Um, so my, my name is David Williams, but my artist name is David Boomer. And that's B-O-O-M-A-H. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm on Spotify, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter. So all of these social networks, you know, you'll find me. But um, and Sa I'm, I'm on SoundCloud as well. But if you just type in David Boomer, there is no other David Boomer spelt like that. So I think I'm easy to find. Now we talked about, uh, okay, later we talk about music, but before we talked a lot about uh, your youth uh, program, which has really been very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now to conclude the conversation, what would be uh, your final thought here? Um, well, I mean, yeah, I just, um, I think it might, it would be unfair for me not to speak about the, 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 the charitable company that, I, that I'm the CEO of. So I, um, I, uh, the last, the last job I had, um, which was about two years ago, I was working in a very prolific young offenders institution. So like a, a youth prison in the UK called Feltham. Um, and it's, it's, you know, quite a challenging role managing the youth service in Feltham prison, working with young people that have committed lots of different crimes. Um, and, and it's very challenging working with that group. And when I left um, Feltham, I was inspired to, to set up this charity to work with at-risk young people. And what I wanted to do with the charity is to actually um, create a school so that, I could, so that I could work with young people from an early age and stop them ending up in prison in the first place. So, uh, so that is something that I'm working on at the moment. I'm still working towards building the school uh, and, um, you know, I, that's looking really promising and I'm, I'm crossing my fingers that everything is going to get sorted out. So, so I, I, I'd be very grateful if people would check out the charitable work that I'm doing on Forward Ever Education. So that's www.forwardevereducation.co.uk. We also do lots of other services. We do consultancy for organisations that work with children at risk. We do training for the staff that work in those organisations. And we run lots of projects like music programs, um, um, computer technology programs, dance programs, um, and, and we run mentoring programs for children that need one-to-one -one support that are struggling or going through um, certain issues. So, um, so, so we're doing a lot. We're trying to do all, all that we can for young people at risk and young people that might be falling through the gaps of education, young people that are in social services that need additional support. And we just want to promote that and, con and continue to push that. Um, and yeah, um, yeah, my, 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 final, my final words would be, please take up the challenge to finding your authentic self. You owe it to yourself to be happy and true happiness lies in authenticity. So find your authentic self. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate your time and also the sharing. I really do. Thank, Thank you. you very much for having me on your podcast. You know, I, 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 I'm very, very grateful and humble. Thank you. Thank you for that. If you enjoy this podcast, make sure you subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes. Rate our review Obehead podcast and share with your friends who might need it. I remain Obehead everyone for. Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you in the next episode.